the Megan and I were going to try to become city kids. I'm sorry to say after a few months, my mother's boyfriend raped me. I, after Bailey encouraged me to tell him the name of the rapist, I said, I can't because he will kill you. He told me he would kill you. Bailey was lying. He said, I will not allow him. So I told him. And the man was put in jail for one day and released. The next, about three days later, Bailey and I were on my mother's, mother's floor, that grandmother. We were playing a game we call Monopoly, because we never heard it for now. With big brass buttons and blue serge uniforms. And they told my mother's mother that the man had been found dead, and he seemed he'd been kicked to death. This, this statement so, so struck me that I stopped speaking. I thought my voice had killed the man. I stopped speaking for about six years. The only person I trusted myself to speak to was my brother. I knew I loved him so much and he loved me so much I wouldn't, I could my voice wouldn't hurt him. But I thought my voice could kill people. Just out, I mean, boys go out of the window and out the door. And my voice would kill people, so it was better not to speak. And other people did their best to try to move me away from my mutism. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't, they didn't know what my voice would do. I knew. After a few months, they wearied of this sullen, silent child. So they sent me back to my grandma in Stamps, Arkansas. Mama with that way of talking. Sometimes she didn't even say the whole word, she'd just say syllables, one after the other. Mama would braid my hair the way old black ladies still braid girls' hair. I'd sit on the floor, on a pillow. Mama would sit back that way. I would grab, we both looked out. I'd grab Mama's thighs like that. My hair was huge and very curly. And mom would say, sister, she'd bend her hand like that and put it behind my neck so she wouldn't break my neck by accident. <laughs> <laughs> mama don't care what these people say about you must be an idiot or you must be a moron because you can't talk. Sister, mama don't care. Mama know when you and the good Lord get ready, sister, you're going to be a teacher. You're going to teach all over this world. My God. I used to sit there and keep this At present, I have 70 doctorates. <laughs> Seven zero. I teach in French and Spanish, oh. in English and drama. Oh, wow. Wow. I'm a fellow at Yale, and I'm on the board of the Library of Harvard. I taught in Rome at the Rome Theater. I taught in Tel Aviv at the Havima Theater. Imagine, imagine if anyone had seen me and said, this black girl, she's not going anywhere. She can't even talk. Look at that. Look at it. But because, I mean, if, if, you did, if I hadn't started with that song, you may think I'm bragging on myself. I'm bragging on the rainbows in my clouds. Watch my feet. Look at those young men up here. And young women, look at them up. In, in, opening up this, this convocation. I mean, and they, they are from different schools in Chicago. Which means they're already sacrificing to go and go to some school to rehearse so that they could come here and entertain you. Already rainbows they are, and entertain 10,000 rainbows. Look at it. I know 
I know that I, I'm not asked to speak all day. <laughs> I, and I'm not going to, but, but I did want to, to just em, be emphatic in, uh, in reminding you of, of this, this wonderful time you had to encourage each other to continue. Um, the, uh, I'm, I'm wearing the dark glasses because, um, not for Hollywood's sake, <laughs> but because um, my right eye has gone uh, somewhere in a bucket. <laughs> But that part of it is just, I've been looking out of it, them so long. And it is true, I thank uh, my introducer, uh, who told you that I'll be 85 in a couple of weeks. I already feel like it. <laughs> but um, after I had, at Mr. Clinton's uh, request, written a poem for his first inauguration, United Nations uh, personnel called me and asked if I would come to the 50th anniversary of the, of the founding of the United Nations. Would I come? Would I write a poem for the world? Would I um, come to San Francisco and do the poem at a place to signify the place where the United Nations was founded? Now, when the United Nations was founded, I was 16. I was six foot tall. I was black, even then. <laughs> I was pregnant, about to finish high school, and unmarried. And the newspapers in San Francisco, the Chronicle and the Examiner and the Call Bulletin, all said that there were people who would be paid $150 a week to be simultaneous translators at United Nations. I knew that I had a penchant for languages. And I would go down to where the people would meet and watch them go into the building. I watched <coughs> Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt go in with her friend, the black educator, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. I'd watch them go in and I would cry copiously thinking if I wasn't six foot tall and black and female and pregnant and un unmarried and uneducated, I could go in that building. I could learn some language. I could be paid $150 a week. Imagine my feeling when I was asked to come back, come to San Francisco and deliver this poem. white ones, black ones, some Spanish-speaking girls who helped me to learn my first foreign language. Imagine when I, I just couldn't, I could hardly keep from weeping in gratitude. What I have is an attitude of gratitude. That's what I have to all the men and women who were kind to me and encouraging to me. Here's the point. I'm happy to know that you're going to be able to unload this, or whatever the word is. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I want you to have this word. And please think of it as written for you, each one of you. Mr. Clyder from Virginia, Miss Hill, Chicago, Miss Bird, each one of you, Miss Taylor. All of you, the come incoming and outgoing. Mr. Healy, yes. Please take this point and see that it is written for you. We, this people, on a small and lonely planet, traveling through casual space, past the loose stars, across the way of indifferent suns, to a destiny.